The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss what you should be considering if you're going to build or buy a greenhouse, as well as cover crops. What are they? What benefit do they have to your garden? As well as author Noel Johnson will be with us and will answer your garden questions. So the hour is full. Why don't you join us? You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome. Thank you for joining us on another episode, edition of the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Happy you're tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023, through our parent website, which is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Underneath the Season 7 tab at the top of the page, in-studio video replay, podcast replay, however you're doing it, thank you very much. You want to be part of the program, in addition to listening, you can do that by sending us an email to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Send us your question or just saying hi, I'm listening to you on this station or this format and this location. Or you can give us a call toll-free, coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Going to get in the program here. We're going to start with cover crops, Holly. Uh, some people, uh, and, and we are uh, in this category, we don't, we've never dealt heavily in dealing with uh, our cover, uh, planting our beds and cover crops after we've removed the intended crop in which we grew. Or grow. Yeah, we have grown. Right. Um, so, yeah, so cover crops are helpful for for many reasons. And well, they, what for those, we've heard the term cover crop. What is a cover crop? What is the primary purpose of one saying, I'm going to plant a cover crop in this bed? Well, for I guess there's not really a primary purpose, but it forms a living mulch. Um, it helps reduce soil splash and erosion, and it keeps the weeds usually in check, and it's a green manure. Uh, it, it's a living item that is going to, at a certain point, be cut down or chopped or tilled under or mixed under in order to utilize that plant as a free fertilizer, essentially, or a free soil builder to enrich the ability of your soil to grow the next crop better. Right. That's exactly what it's going to do. And they're considered green manures because... It doesn't smell. Well, it doesn't smell. I mean, people associate manure with uh, bad smell. Right. But it also affixes a lot of nitrogen to the soil. Um, And so it also... um, as the organic matter and the nutrients without having to smell, without having to worry about aging manure, having to worry to obtain the manure. Maybe you live in an area where getting manure would not be ideal or easy or simple. Or you don't want to deal with it. Or you don't want to deal with it. I know for me, I don't want to deal with manure. So, Well, you wouldn't qualify as a very good farm person to begin with. No. No. You, no. you couldn't you couldn't move the gate quick enough if you're sorting cows. You know, you yeah. like to say this to me, <laughs> yeah. and then I'm going to flip the switch on you, uh-huh. because I had to teach you how to drive properly in the city. Well, I don't think there's a qualification now if you drove in any city whatsoever. I think it's every man and woman for themselves. Right. But back then, <laughs> when we were dating, I had to show you how to drive properly in the city, because you just were all over the place. Well... And still, to this day, I still have to check you and be like, no, this is the exit, not this exit, one more mile. So sometimes you, you, you know, you can tell me that I'm not a good farm person, but just because what is like being a farmer, the ultimate? No, it's not. There's other they skills. They feed all of us. There's other skill. No, I'm not, I'm no disrespect <laughs> to farmers at all, but there's a skill to a lot of things and that includes city driving. And also there's just things that you aren't, aren't good at either because of how you were raised you maybe could carry four or five gallon buckets at one time with ground feed i could yeah, probably it would hurt your fingers but you could probably make it done i could get it done yeah you get it done 
Yeah. How much does a five gallon bucket I, weigh with ground feed? I'm going to say 30 pounds. Yeah, I could do that. 30 pounds base. Anyway, uh, for more farm talk, you can. Uh, so, what type of plants and can one plant that would define as being a cover crop? Um, so there are there are a couple of them or a number of them actually. So there's mostly legumes, which are things like vetch, clover, beans, and peas, and then there's grasses such as rye grass, rye grass, oats, rapeseed, winter wheat, and winter rye and buckwheat. Now we're not growing these to the full mature, like beans or peas. Uh, we're not growing these to get a harvest. We are growing them. Typically, you're going to uh, turn them under or chop and drop them prior to or right at the point of flowering uh, because some of these you don't want them to flower because they're going to turn into a, a pasture in your garden. You want to uh, get the nutrients. You want to get the plant to grow, photosynthesize, pick up that green, you know, that nitrogen in the leaves, and then you're either going to chop and drop it or you're going to till it in or incorporate it into the bed right and so yeah so that just adds the organic matter that takes the nitrogen and gas from the air they convert it into the plants and then through the roots once you chop and drop it chop and drop right and then it fixes that nitrogen legumes which are peas or beans and, and clover and that kind of they actually have uh little beads or little bumps on their roots if you harvest like this as summer's coming to a close if you pull up a bean plant you're going to see if everything is really in, in good harmony you're going to see the roots and you're going to see growths coming off of that root and you may think un, un, as an uneducated person or a, a non-gardener you may think oh there's some disease here but that's actually the the nitrogen being fixed into the root system that the beans and the peas have exactly and the beans and peas are going to typically use their nitrogen before they use the nitrogen that's in the soil. Right. Because that's nature. 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 Yes. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so cover crops and just just a few things, for example, one is to keep in mind that there might be a preferred cover crop for where you are or perhaps where you, what you're growing maybe maybe something you have easy access to you have the seeds maybe you already have the seeds maybe you just think you want to try that certain thing it's really up to you um one thing that i do want to talk about is that there are um there are clovers yes and there's different varieties and the one variety that is best is called it's a white clover and it's called the ladino or ladino so that's the one that makes the best cover crop so i guess doing your research is is good maybe i don't i think all of these grow in more northern zones mm -hmm. pretty well but you never know okay so when is the best time to plant a cover crop well right now late summer or early fall fall is a good time to do that they're going to get established and grow during the fall and based on your conditions somewhat in the winter and then in the spring you're going to plow it under or you're going to turn it under spade it under in order to asphyxiate that plant back under the soil in order to build that soil structure up as a free me as a free inexpensive way of soil conditioning so story time yeah when you and i first started dating i uh -huh. asked if there was anything growing on your farm and you said winter wheat right is there a difference between winter wheat and summer wheat? Uh, winter wheat is it grow it gets established. You plant it right in you plant it in fall because it's a hectic time. You're harvesting soybeans, corn, and you're also planting wheat. The purpose of that is you don't have to plant it in the spring when you're trying to plant soybeans and corn and do other things. You'll plant it in the fall. It gets established two or three inches tall, kind of like garlic. And then in the spring in southern Illinois, it will grow, and then you harvest it typically mid June, early July. There's, and there is such thing, I, I believe there's such a thing as spring wheat where you plant it in the spring and you harvest it later on in the summer. But this was just a way to uh, stretch out the not having to do everything at once, plant corn, soybeans, wheat, even though you're harvesting everything in the fall and you're planting. So it, it's a wheat that goes into dormancy and then you harvest it in the spring. And typically in January when the ground is frozen, you'll yeah, on certain fields you would broadcast uh clover red clover and then once the 
corn, uh, the wheat is harvested, you would bale up the remains, the stubble, into stubble clover in round bales, and then the following year you would have a, a thick field of regular clover for hay. All right. <clears throat> then you would spray it and plant corn in it. That's a whole a whole plan. There. Yep. Yep. So just uh, if you're not good at crop rotation, marry a farmer. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So anyway, <laughs> well, in, in, a, in a backyard garden, crop rotation is not mandatory or essential if you continue to uh, allow the soil to have good health as long as you build that soil up. Because in in agri- large, big agricultural uh, applications, the the soil's dead. It's a medium. They're pumping chemicals and fertilizer to get the plant to grow. In gardening, we're utilizing the soil as the means of nutrient to feed the plant. We're not adding stuff to feed the plant. The soil's feeding the plant, and we feed the soil. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's cover crops. And, and it's not required. You don't have to use a cover crop. You don't cover crop. You don't have to plant now or ever. It's just some people choose to utilize that means in order to uh, do something beneficial for their soil. And I think that if you do have the space and you want to try, and also um, when I was doing some research, is yep. it's not a bad idea if you are expanding your garden and you want, and you're not really, maybe you did a soil test, you need to affix more nitrogen. That's one of the things you want to affix. You could dig up that soil now or turn it over or whatever plant the cover crop and then you will Well, also if you don't want to plant something to cover that soil to keep other weeds and vegetation from a nice thick bed of flower uh, of of clover or rye or or something to really choke out anything that may be coming up absolutely so walton's inc.com is a place for everything you need if you're in the seasoning and spicing world spices world or butchering or just need something to do Utilize equipment for meat cutting. Everything but the meat. Waltonsinc.com. We are brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from, canning, preserving your fruits and vegetables. But what about the meat? At Walton's Inc., you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat products your way to your high standards. Do you want to make snack sticks that people actually like? Walton's has their website called meatjuststicks.com. It's an informational site to help you make the best finished product. They have a full line of meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, and more to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's everything but the meat. You can use code GROW50 to save 10% off your orders of $50 or more at waltonsinc.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about greenhouses, whether you're building or buying things to consider that you may not have thought about. You're tuned in to The Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Group 6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. Their belts are minimalist and one-of-a-kind with no holes or flap hanging over. Designs and styles for men and women. Something for everyone. Versatile to mix and match fashionable buckles and belt webbing. Colorful or timeless designs to match your style. You know how bulky and uncomfortable a belt can be, but not a problem with the Grip 6 belt. Comfortable but durable, a belt that moves and works with you and your lifestyle. Perfect for all the bending, twisting, shifting, and moving during gardening, yard work, and all of your everyday life. It's almost like you're not wearing a belt at all. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip 6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, walls, and socks at Grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at Grip6. Com. Dripping Springs Oreos clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oreos, O L L A S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. 
step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mart.com to shop for all your needs. When a family of fruit flies accompanies the fresh fruits and vegetables from your garden, you need rescue fruit fly traps. Rescue fruit fly traps use a food grade lure that fruit flies can't resist. And thanks to their no tip design, you won't have to worry about spills on your kitchen counters. Get rid of fruit flies fast with rescue fruit fly traps. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves to protect you against the elements. While farming, farmer's sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicky material with UBF Protection Factor 50 Plus to protect you from allergies and scratches. To find their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. So do you have a greenhouse? Are you thinking about a greenhouse? Well, there's some things in which one needs to consider. Now, we in the in the Milwaukee area, Chippewa Falls, Twin Cities area. We have Wisconsin Greenhouse Company as a sponsor of the program. They do fantastic and phenomenal work. Uh, as simplistic or as elaborate as you want a greenhouse to be, those are the people to get a hold of, which Wisconsin Greenhouse Company. But if you're building or buying wherever you're at, there's a number of things in one one needs to consider. I think the most uh, the the biggest question is number one: Do you really need a greenhouse? Not to detour you from this is my dream, but there are purposes for a greenhouse, good reasons and bad, and you just don't want to go out and spend the money, the time, the effort for something that is not going to meet your requirements as a gardener. Right. So you have to think about one of the one of the first things that you want to think about is what will you use it for? So, for example, maybe you just want a small little walk in type of greenhouse where you're going to start seeds and then perhaps extend the seasons by maybe moving some containers in there or something like that. Or you want something larger where you're going to do something where you'll start seeds in there, but then you'll also use it as like an outdoor patio entertainment area etc or perhaps a hybrid situation or maybe you just want to to know your options versus cost and what you can do with a greenhouse okay now if you there, there's different types of greenhouses here there's the kind that you buy at the garden center that's a little 10 by 4 it's got some metal shells and if the wind picks up the town next to you gets a free greenhouse <laughs> then there is a f- greenhouses that have a foundation that has you know you've poured a, a, a slab potentially and they are fixated to the ground there are some that are not fixated to the ground but they are heavy enough in which they're not going to become a kite during a windstorm it, the, your mileage may vary on this but do you need a permit? Are you even allowed to have such a unit in your residence, on your residence, on your property, in your HOA, in your town? And we, we're not going to get, because it's an hour show, we're not going to, it's America, we should be able to have what we want on our own property. I get that. I understand that. Uh, vote somebody else in if you don't like the rules. Uh, so you need to figure out the zoning for your particular area. Now in the country, that's a different thing. You kind of do what you want. And not a lot of people say anything, but if you're in an HOA or in a very tight suburbia area, people watching everything you do. 
And if you and and based on is it going to be heated? Is it going to be electric? That determines in some atm- in some environments whether you can or can't have it. If it's not going to be heated, it's not going to have electric. It's considered an outbuilding, so it's okay. But if it's going to be electric, it's a whole other thing in on your property and, and with taxes and insurance and township rules and zoning. Or you can build a really high fence and nobody will know it's electric. That might be against some rules as well. <laughs> Just saying. There's, you know, read between the lines. So, yeah. So zoning, how much space it's going to take up, heating, electric, ventilation, fans, what have you. And, and then the other thing is, okay, and, and we're going we're gonna, to, you know, go down this rabbit hole. If it's an outbuilding and you can have it, but it cannot be affixated to electricity, is it okay for you to have a very large power station to power that greenhouse, even though it's technically an outbuilding, as long as you're not connecting it to the grid, is that a loophole? Is that a gray area? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's the thing. Throw the is solar that- panel on top, have your power station inside. It's not connected to the grid. It's an outbuilding. Right. That's another another thing. And there could be, you know, the, the Chad, Chad Canals, which was the, the crew chief for the seven time uh, NASCAR champion, Jimmy Johnson. He said uh, he he reads the rule book not for what's in it, but for what's not in it. And a lot of it's gray area. Gray area. Um, yeah. So there's that. And then so the other thing you consider is if, do you want to go with a, a DIY situation? Do you want to go with something where somebody installs it and builds it for you? What you know? What's your plan? Or if you want to build it yourself, don't do not go down the road of well. I've never built anything, so I'm just going to hire somebody to build it. There's plenty of information on the thing called the internet that, and you've, you've got friends and family and neighbors and church members or or club members or whatever. Just ask around. You can do this. You're not incapable of building something just because you've never built it before. You're going to make mistakes, yes, but don't ever say, well, I've never done it before, so I guess I can't do it. You can do it. Right. You, cer- you certainly can do it. And that's that's the thing is maybe you can also see how you like it by building like a simple hoop house mm-hmm. and before you decide to invest either more time or more money. And if you build a hoop house, you'll have that plastic. So if you want to make something a little bit more long term, com- complicated, long term, whatever you want to call it. Um, so a hoop house or a high tunnel is basically like a very DIY way, DIY way to have a greenhouse or extend your seasons in a way, but it's kind of more, I guess, quick and dirty or um, less of a huge commitment. Do you already have a greenhouse and you're not aware of it, such as a three season porch or a very, very sunny bay window that you can convert into a very small greenhouse for the time being until you either financially are able to or get the permits needed or actually decide, hey, this has worked very well for three years. Let's go big and let's really commit to this. And I think that's a good idea is because you might see somebody who has a greenhouse and you're like, I want that. I definitely need that in my life. And then after a while, you're like, well, maybe I don't. Just like anything else, ask somebody who has one. Right. Right. Uh, You know, what can I, you know, you got a greenhouse. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? What would you do different if you could do it over again, knowing what you know now? That is one of the best questions that you can ask anybody about anything. You've had it for five years. What's the worst thing about it? And what would you do different if you started all over today? Absolutely. And I think that having other people's opinions and experiences experiences are 100 percent true. And it's something that. You and I have done with a, a lot of things mm-hmm. um, and continue to do. And I think a greenhouse, I think that if I if I were to have a greenhouse, I would have one that was very pretty, it was glass, and I would guarantee that I would make sure that that's something that I wanted and that I could go sit outside, maybe on like whether it be a muggy night or a buggy night or something right. like that, where I'm away from the elements but still kind of within the elements what, is it worth the investment for the few nights a month that I might sit out there? Probably not. But if you do a lot of entertaining or if you want to get really serious about sometimes growing things and you don't have the space inside your home, 
This all makes sense. Well, greenhouses are not greenhouses as they were 30 years ago. Greenhouses today in, in is an addition to the residence. It looks as if it is part of like a it's a guest house almost as elaborate and as beautiful as some of these uh, structures can be. It is sometimes it looks better than the house itself. This is true. And we've seen some beautiful ones by the Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, yes. um, you know, at different places. And they do they do a really beautiful job. So there are there is that option. You, if you did it, you could have you could do tropical plants inside have half of it as a top tropical greenhouse. and The other has half as a hot tub. Right. <laughs> there's. I don't know if the chlorine would mess. I'm sure that would mess well, you probably, the plants all up. Yeah, probably. You'd have to, to do some sort On of... On paper, it looked good. Natural natural uh, filtration or yeah. something. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, greenhouses, it, it, it's a unique thing. And we grew and grow and still continue to grow indoors without a greenhouse. We start our seeds indoors. We have them under the Happy Leaf LED grow light. Uh, you know, and if you want a happy leaf LED grow light for uh, winter growing here, you can, or, or anytime, you can use coupon code Joey Holly to save uh, ten uh, to save ten percent off orders over ninety dollars at happyleafled.com. That's uh, Joey Holly in the coupon code, and you can save some money there. Phenomenal lights; they've they've worked for years. We've never had a problem. We've had them since twenty. 13, I believe it's been. Um, so it's a really thing. But we, we used to grow without grow lights, too. And it was a west-facing window, and the plants would grow towards the window, and every day we'd rotate the trays, and they'd grow back. It really makes a whole lot better whenever you have the best grow lights on the market. Uh, the plants really seem to be happier uh, whenever... Well, they are happier when you grow uh, with the best grow lights. So you don't need a greenhouse, Obviously, a greenhouse provides you much more surface area and a much more uh, 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 freer palette um, to paint with plants and start things that you could never start indoors or never would have the space to start indoors. I I totally agree. And even if you, you've heard all this and you're like, heck with growing stuff in green, my greenhouse, I want this extra patio in closed space, then that's fair too. And in some places uh, in the northern areas, people would grow things, they'll, they'll heat it, they will grow things like pineapple, which takes 18 months, 24 months, and other things like municipal herbs, uh, medicinal. medicinal herbs, mm -hmm. uh, because it's legal to do in many states, and it's a reality that whether you are anti that or not, it's happening, it is legal. Um, not from a federal level, but from a state, yes, I, I understand that. And there are some independent studies that have shown that there is some great benefits if used properly to help certain elements in the human body. So there's a lot of things in which you can grow and a lot of things in which you need to consider before you just go 8 by 12, there it is in the backyard, let's start building it up, the lumber's coming this afternoon. And don't think that somebody won't report you because they will. You got to be careful. They may just report you for thinking of it. Right. Yeah. Well, Holly, summer is coming to a close and the kids are back in school or very close to it. Nights are colder and you've probably just kind of given up and forgotten about the lawn and said, shove it. But you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have problems next spring. I, I don't know. Some people are still probably thinking about their lawns, but just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about it. And those Japanese beetles, we can't forget about them either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only did they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs on your turf so they can start again next year. Take a stand with Phylum Scrub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granule that specifically tar scar targets scare pests and their larvae. You apply the granule with a spreader. You're getting into the soil and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. The best part of Grub Gone, it's easy to use and it's the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls grubs. And the best part about it, it's non-toxic to bees and other beneficial insects. So you don't, uh, Grub Gone has no label restrictions, so you don't have to worry about intoxifying the flowers that these insects are consuming the pollen from. To learn more, you can go to grubgone.com or phylumbioproducts.com, the natural choice. When we come back, author Noel Johnson will be with us. 
You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Blue Ribbon Organics providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. When I commit to someone, I want them to commit back to me for, you know, life. That's why I love, love Verlo Mattress. When you buy a Verlo, you get something nobody else offers, a commitment to helping you love your sleep for as long as you own your mattress with a lifetime comfort guarantee. Those other places, well, you get a measly 60, 90, maybe 120 nights. Not even close, guys. Wake up, sleep better. Verlo. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again over apply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Going on vacation and can't find a plant sitter? Check out Tree Diaper. It can provide perfect soil moisture for plants for weeks, even months. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at TreeDiaper.com. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, no more bugs, environmentally friendly, made in the USA. No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, and more. No More Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. Visit nomorebugs.net for free shipping on orders over $50. Use code free ship for me. Fleet Farm has everything you need to get ready for the canning season. Pick up all your supplies from start to finish as you begin to harvest your garden. Choose from an assortment of jars, strainers, racks, and funnels. Plus, check out the wide selection of mixes, sugar, vinegar, and more. Get what you need for your everyday life, including canning, at new lower prices. Fleet Farm and fleetfarm.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food, traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you or your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information and get your Rise Gardens, visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Noelle Johnson is a desert plant garden educator, author, horticulturist, presenter, and more. She is known as the AZ or Arizona Plant Lady, and her book is called Dry Climate Gardening. Welcome to the program, Noelle. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, let's start with this. You're, we've got listeners all over the country, and I, I think the unique aspect or the, the challenge that everybody faces is how do we grow things when there's not a lot of water? But how did you get into desert gardening? Was this an, uh, ac- was this an accident or a, a happy thing that happened, or, or you grew up with it? Purely by accident. I uh, married the love of my life and moved to Arizona. Always a good thing. Yes, it was. And and we bought, which he was from here, and we bought our first home. And I had visions of having a little garden plot and growing vegetables and having beautiful flowering plants. And so I set to work on that. I ordered plants from a catalog because back in those days, that was what you had to do. There was no internet. 
And all the things said that they would survive in my zone nine garden. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, about six months after I had gotten all my new plants, every single one of them was dead. I killed everything. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. And I realized that while I checked with the, the USDA zones for minimum cold temperatures, those didn't take into account how hot the desert gets. And that not a lot of that those plants that I had purchased were not suitable for the climate. And sadly, there were very few resources available to me to figure out how do I de garden successfully in the desert. So I started to make the trip down to the library and learned what I could, but there was precious little. And so I decided at that point, I had two years of college under my belt and I had been at a standstill for several years because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Well, now I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to learn about gardening and gardening in the desert and figure out how to do it right so that I could help others do it in the future. Fantastic. That is a uh... Really great. So what are some unexpected challenges in dry climate gardening that maybe people should know about or you just faced and how did you overcome them? Oh, sure. Well, there are several challenges with dry climate gardening. And you, the first and foremost is uh, making sure that we are using water as wisely as possible. Our water resources here uh, in the west and southwestern United States are shrinking. And whereas in the past you could turn on the hose or turn on your irrigation system and not really think about where the water's coming from, now we have to start to think about that. Some municipalities are putting in watering restrictions. You're limited as to what days you can water. And so we need to use it <laughs> responsibly. And the good news is that we can have an amazing, beautiful garden because there are countless plants that do beautifully uh, in a dry climate and add a lot of beauty to your outdoor space. And you would never know that they were lower water use plants. And I'd say one other thing that is challenging, and in this case, it's more for a, a desert <laughs> type garden, is that if you read a plant label, and you're looking for recommended plant exposure, uh, if it says full sun, it doesn't necessarily mean it could handle the intense full sun of a dry climate. So uh, a lot of people can, can experience disappointment when they see that because they follow the directions on the label, yet their plant kind of got a little crispy or wilty and failed to thrive. So that's why using and utilizing local resources are really vital, such as your botanical garden, uh, looking at local nurseries for resources. And most municipalities, uh, larger ones, have watering guidelines that are specific for your locality. Well, for people who uh, have only heard things about Arizona and the heat, and it's a dry heat, uh, <laughs> is there a uh, does the municipalities encourage or provide rebates on manipulating your landscape to a more of a desert climate environment, like ripping out the yard, and or what, is there a lot of rain enough rainfall in order to incorporate rain cl collection? Uh, attributes to the property, rain barrels and that, in order to utilize that for the plants? Yes. So, first of all, many municipalities do offer rebates for ripping out your lawn because that's the thirstiest plant mm -hmm. <laughs> that we have and it requires a large amount of supplemental water. And the sprinkler system, you know, when you use your sprinklers to water a gra your grass in an arid climate, up to 50% of that water evaporates immediately into the air before it ever hits the ground. So there are rebates available for people who want to rip out their, their lawn in many 
towns and cities. So that's definitely something to look into. Water harvesting is a big deal and it can be done. Uh, where I live, we get about eight inches a year. Mm. Uh, that's equally split between winter and summer. And so you can use rain barrels and water tanks, but you can also do passive water harvesting and um, contour the landscape so that you are capturing water as it runs off from your roof and you can channel it to your plants. Eight inches, that's not much. (laughs) Definitely not. So you have a book called Dry Climate Gardening. Can you tell us more about it? Um, Maybe something that would pique our listeners' interest to go and pick up a copy to uh, check it out. Oh, certainly. I wrote this book because I wanted a resource for other gardeners that I didn't have. And I poured all my knowledge into it. And much of it is what I teach to my clients because I work as a landscape consultant. And this is is meant to be a guide that is easy to follow so that people do not experience the overwhelm that I did. We have a lot of people moving into this area. Uh, Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country. Uh, Most people don't know that. And it's growing and growing and growing. And so the goal of the book was to show people break gardening down easily in an arid climate. How do you do it successfully? And what most people mention about the book is it does a lot of myth busting in terms of um, people think that that a dry climate garden is is brown filled with rocks and really boring but it can be exactly the opposite it can be full of color and pollinators and in many areas throughout the southwest you can garden 12 months out of the year and have things growing well and and you look at photographs of the desert it's not just dead plants there's a lot of flowers and wildlife and activity going on even though it's in a very warm and and, and hot area yes and that speaks to how plants have adapted over time and they've adapted to survive within that climate and do it very well now you're originally from southern california and <laughs> are are there things that you miss about gardening in southern california or is or is it so different that you've kind of forgot about that no uh i did do gardening when i was younger <laughs> You know, people have said this to me, and I feel the same way, is you can throw a plant on the ground, you barely have to dig a hole, and it'll probably grow just fine. Because, you know, most of California, especially around the coastal areas, have a wonderful Mediterranean climate. And so there aren't a lot of extreme challenges, except now with our water supply shrinking, that is definitely affecting Um, Mediterranean climates around California and deserts in California as well. So the push there is to really uh, use native plants or, or native or arid adapted plants, plants that come from a similar region that can get by with less water, but it is easier to garden there. (laughs) Well, as the environment changes, some people label it climate change. Other people just say it's the way things are going. What are Mm -hmm. some of your heat proof gardening tips that not only can be used in Arizona, but anywhere in the country when we get these really hot summers? Yes. The number one heat proof gardening tip, no matter where you live, is planting more trees. And Some people will say, well, you know, I have a couple of big trees. I don't have enough room for another big tree. Well, there are smaller trees out there. You can plant smaller trees. You can plant tall shrubs that will provide shade at certain times of of the day. And more than anything else, that is going to drop the temperature around the plants that get to enjoy that shade And it makes a big difference. We have had record-breaking temperatures um, in the Southwest this summer. And I know much of the South has, and I know the Midwest just had a big heat wave as well. I was in Minneapolis a month ago, and then it was pretty toasty up there. But when it comes to um, saving water, shade is really going to be 
the biggest thing that we can do moving forward. And uh, luckily, you know, trees are beautiful. They are very good for the environment. And this is the strategy uh, to begin now because trees take a, a while to get growing. We may not have a record-breaking summer next year, but I guarantee you um, there is a gen, there is a definite upward trend of temperatures, and we need to be proactive. Well, and the trees. Well, I don't, I don't have room. The other trees are eventually going to die. So go ahead and plant the trees where you want. And it's easy to trim. It's hard to get that tree to go grow in 20 years in two months. Yes. Yeah, it is. So uh, another thing that we do, um, particularly if there is a, uh, a short-term heat wave, you can use shade cloth. Mm-hmm. Shade cloth is your best friend. <laughs> you can buy it at the nursery, but you can also order it online very easily. And you can use shade cloth to provide temporary shade, which is helpful for plants, particularly during a, a period where you are having a heat wave. So that could be a really helpful tool to have. Is, is there a certain percentile of shade that you recommend because they come in all grades? They do. So 50% is a good general uh, one to use for most types of plants, and you can use it for vegetable gardens. If you are looking at providing some protection for uh, succulents or cacti, things that um, normally thrive in full sun and heat and hot conditions, a 30% shade cloth would be sufficient. So this has been some really great information, um, and we have enjoyed having you on the program. How can people find out more about you? And get that book. Um, yeah, and get your book. <laughs> well, the book is available everywhere where you sell books. You can buy it on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can look uh, online with independent booksellers. You can get it there as well. Uh, to find out more about me, uh, you can visit my website at azplantlady.com. I'm also on Instagram at az.plant.lady and Facebook at azplantlady. Well, Noel, we greatly appreciate the time and the information that is very relatable and relatable to many aspects and, and parts of the country. Because of your experience, you've, you've helped a lot of plants survive the heat. Thank you very much Thank for that. Thank you. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit Rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at RootMaker.com. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control. 
watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. It's time for garden questions and answers. You got one? Send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. It doesn't have to be during the show. You can send it over any time as well as give us a call 24-7-365 at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. This question, Holly, is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. I know a yellow cucumber is overripe and bitter. Can I leave it on the vine and save seeds from it? Yes and no. If you, uh, you, you can stay on the vine, if you're going to try to save seeds, stay on the vine as long as possible, almost to the point where it's falling off the vine. And then you can save it. You uh, go ahead and, and rinse the seeds off through a, a sieve and you let them dry and label them. Now, here's the no aspect of that. If you are growing additional varieties of cucumbers in your garden or you know neighbors who are growing cucumbers and you're in a very prolific gardening community or a uh, uh, what the community garden or a allotment or whatever the case is then no because cucumbers easily cross pollinate and a cucumber can cross pollinate or be pollinated uh, across varieties up to a half mile away. Now, this is no guarantee saying that if uh, you've got cucumbers and you're four houses down from you have cucumbers that you're going to get, and they've got lemon cucumbers and you've got pickling, that you're going to get some kind of morphation. Uh, and if you save the seeds and you grow them next year, that's this weird cucumber is going to develop. It doesn't mean that. But the, uh, pro- uh, the, uh, hypo- the uh, probability that uh, you'll have some cross in that there is some likelihood to that. So it just is better if you um, go buy fresh seeds from JungSeed.com. Use coupon code 10TG23 to save 10% on your orders at Jung, J-U-N-G-S-E-E-D.com. And uh, get they've got a, several, there are a handful of varieties there, just so you're guaranteed to know that what you're planting is what you're going to get. All right, Holly. So the next question is, as I bought some pots to plant herbs in, but they don't have holes in the bottom. Do I need to somehow poke or or drill holes in them, or is there a different solution? Yes, uh, any item in which you are going to plant in any type of container, drainage has to be achieved. Otherwise, you're going to have a dead plant. Soil, roots, all of that needs oxygen. And if you completely muck it up with water that can't drain you've turned into a bog and a soggy mess and everything's going to die so if it's plastic it's easy to either drill holes in it or safely get some type of nail heat it up over a form of heat and melt holes into it if it is ceramic uh, you're going to need a masonry drill bit because if you just try to hammer holes or drill holes in it, there's a, a, a pretty good chance you're going to crack the pot and you're, you've ruined the pot in which you've got uh, for this application. Uh, anything else, like grow bags are naturally porous. You don't have to worry about that, but you do need drainage. Uh, Five-gallon bucket, same thing. If you are... Uh, you want to be sure you have ample drainage. So, you know, you get some of these pots have one hole in the center. If you can achieve three or four to allow adequate drainage, because it's always easy to add water, but if water is pooling up 
in the bottom of a pot, it's going to create a musty, muggy, sloppy, choke out oxygen to the root system and can actually damage the plant's root development as well because it can't grow into the water. We're not we're not uh, doing lake plants here or anything like that. <laughs> so yeah, any type of drainage you need, any type of pot you need drainage, and however you can achieve that safely, that's what you need to do. Fantastic. So then the next question that we got in was, I harvested some ripe garden tomatoes, but I have to leave town for a few days. Can I put them in the fridge while I'm gone so they don't get too ripe? You don't want to put tomatoes in the fridge. Uh, it changes the, uh, the the sugars inside of the tomato, doesn't it? You will once they're ripe. It doesn't make a huge change. And just a cold tomato doesn't not appetizing to me. Well, you could put them in the fridge and then take them out before you're going to serve them. True, but a, a ripe in, in order to ripen tomatoes, tomatoes can be harvested. But this is this is a ripe tomato. It's already ripe. Yes. Um, I guess I, I I say put them in the fridge. Well, yeah, it's going to slow down. It's like bread. You put bread in the fridge on yeah. a warm day to keep it from potentially molding. Right. Um, you could put it in the fridge. Yes. However, um, it, you don't want to do it for prolonged, like weeks and weeks and weeks, because it will go bad on you. Uh, but a couple of days, you would be okay. Um, just make a BLT before you go and use the tomato up, and or take it with you. Take it with you. Take it with you. Give them to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you love them or not. Get, get <laughs> people, rid of it. People like tomatoes. And yes. And they get excited well, for people, garden tomatoes. Right. Those whom have consumed a garden tomato before. If you've only had the cardboard grocery store tomatoes, uh, you don't, or the, you know, the, the, the fast food restaurant tomatoes that are slightly green and you gnaw through, it, there's no comparison to a homegrown tomato. No, I know... Um my friend and I were on a trip recently and we went out somewhere and they put a tomato as a garnish and it was the saddest looking tomato. It was not. Yeah. It It was like, we got to get rid of this. So it's put on the side of the plate. Yeah. Green in the inside. Not, and not like green tomato green. It was like sad, sad tomato green. Yeah. So I, I say put them in, if they're ripe, you can put them in the fridge for a few days. It's not a big deal. Like Joy said, I wouldn't leave them in there, you know, for a long time. The other thing you can do if you've got a lot of tomatoes and, you know, you don't want to can them or you can't can them or you've canned all you want, start dehydrating tomatoes. Sun, I mean, they're considered sun-dried tomatoes, but put them in the dehydrator and we've got still bags of tomatoes from years ago that are still just perfectly fine. And you can use them in multiple applications. If you're making noodles, you throw a handful of them in and they will add, you know, they'll kind of rehydrate uh, lasagna, whatever, whatever you're doing, you can add the dehydrated tomatoes and you can also eat them as well but it just adds a unique fresh flavor even though they've been dehydrated but that's a good way to get rid of a lot of tomatoes and that's what we're going to end up doing with some of our tomatoes because we're getting quite a few is just dehydrate them and utilize them for other applications right so then the the next question is or yeah i grew garlic for the first time i've cured it I've read different things about how to store it, but what what is would you say is the best way? Well, if you cured it properly, the tops are dead, the the green growth is dead, and the roots have dried, and you can re, you can cut them off. Uh, the the stalk you can cut the stalk off, and you can trim the roots, and you simply put them in a. Uh, out of direct sunlight in a cool, dry place, and they will keep for six to eight, maybe nine months. Now, we've got some garlic that's well over a year, and it's starting to go soft, and if you let it too long, it will just completely dehydrate and dry up to nothing, and you squeeze the uh, bulb, and it's just like paper mache in your hands. But if you can get it in a cool, dry place and know that you've got a lot of it, you can dehydrate it, you can roast it, you can do fill in the blank with it, mince it utilize it as quickly as possible as it's getting later on into the um, storage time frame. It makes great gifts. People are not aware of how good homegrown garlic is and how fragrant it is. Not so much spicy, but just the, the aroma, the intensity that a piece of garlic can have. So, with that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today, would like to revisit it. You can do that by going to our 
parent website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, and clicking on the Season 7 tab at the top of the page. Or you can uh, send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to the program. Tune in next week to the program, where we will be talking about gardening mobility limitation options, as well as types of soil that you may have and what you can do or Leave it alone. We'll go over those. And our guest is garden blogger Heather Blackmore Varkels. And we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>